changing in our, uh, economic conditions, especially in terms of raw materials. Um, so we talk mainly about chemical plants. You know, a typical arrangement is you have a refinery. This is the ideal thing. You have a refinery, and that makes raw materials for a chemical plant. That's like Exxon Mobil, where it makes so much money because they do refining and chemicals. Um, the font on the other hand just does chemicals. Um, so depending on the economics, the feedstock to the plant can change a lot, right? Like a barrel of oil, that changes dramatically uh, refining and Um, tighter product specifications. So again, if you're trying to make a product, um, I'll bring up polymers a lot. I, don't know, I know not everyone has background in polymers, but I've done quite a bit of work in polymers, so I know something about them. Um, and that's an example of where, for a typical polymer, there's typically many different companies around the world that can make it. So you have to have some um, specifications for the person that wants. You know, you make polymer for a customer. The customer has certain specifications on the product, and you have to meet those. If you don't, those go to someone else that makes it. Um, for the most part, we hope to be in this situation. So this is what's called, uh, in, in the industry, they call it sold out. That means every pound of material you make, you can sell. That's ideal. If the economy is poor, that's not the case, right? Because you can't sell everything. But if the economy is going well, if you can make another you know, 10,000 pounds of material a day, you can sell that as additional profit. So you're trying to maximize production rates. Um, energy costs, raw material costs are usually, um, although they vary, are trending upward clearly. And there's always more stringent uh, requirements on environmental like emissions from a plant and also um, safety. Okay. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. And the, the idea of control is it's going to help us address some of these challenges. Efficiency. So here's an example. So this, most of the figures, not all, but the vast majority come from the book. You guys have the book at this point? The book is in the bookstore. Do I get the book? Okay. All right. So how much is the book this time? Yeah. I got the International for 35 bucks. <laughs> sure. Okay. What edition is it? Um, third edition. Okay. All right. So uh, anyway, um, 
So if you see pictures like this, you, you can conclude they're from somewhere in the book, usually the chapter which I'm covering. All right, so these are continuous processes. These are the kind of things that I know you've seen. Okay. I know you've seen a heat exchange or a heat mass transfer. These posts, I'm sure you've seen this in kinetics. I'm sure you've seen this ad nauseum in um, separations, the distillation column, right? This is just a cracker or something that you've seen in the refinery. So th these are continuous operations, right? Because you have continuous flow in and out of the system, and, the, and in principle, these things run forever. Okay. Um, I'm guessing you've seen at least this like a batch or semi-batch chemical reactor, you should have covered that in kinetics. So if we have a chemical reactor and it has no feed in or no withdrawal, that's batch. If it has only feed in and no withdrawal, that's semi-batch, or that batch, they call it. And five, five columns, and it has flows in and out, it's continuous. Some other examples are shown here. And so we'll have um, a one lecture explicitly dedicated to talking about some of the challenges with batch processes. Hopefully I'll allude to um, as we go through the course. But if you go into commodity chemicals and refining, you'll see nothing but this here. But if you go into pharmaceuticals or you know, biotechnology or materials processing or something like that, you're much more likely to see batch processing. Okay, so here's the three main elements <coughs> we're going to cover in the course that have to do with um, process control. So there's three main elements, two of which we touched upon a significant degree in 361. So the first thing is process modeling. So if I give you a system of interest to, to you, or to me, more likely, um, then you have to be able to write out the governing equations for these, these you know, so this is like a flow system or a reactor system or a distillation column or something like this, okay? So we talked a lot about that in 361, that's probably the important name of the course is mathematical modeling. So the idea here, in, in, in a practical sense, if you're in, so, okay, so I give you these whole toy problems in class. How is this used in industry? So, um, usually a model of a process is considered an intellectual property for the company. And the idea here is all the knowledge over the years of operating this process and doing experiments and pilot plans in the laboratory are kind of embedded within this model, okay? Um, and we'll talk about modeling of a, of a real process, of a manufacturing process is quite complex and requires a lot of um, time and energy. Um, to me, the ability to do this is, you know, if someone said, what is the main thing you would like to see chemical engineers be able to do, I would say, write models. Because if you can write models of heat transfer and mass transfer and chemical reaction and fluid flow systems, then you know chemical engineering. Because you can't write models if you don't know fluid, you know, transport or, or kinetics, right? So if you can do that, then you really understand. Um, and then ultimately, for this, for our purpose, we'll use these models to kind um, of analyze the dynamics of the system. So a big focus of control, as it was in 361, being even bigger now is this idea of dynamics. Um, and we're also going to use these models as design controllers. So the idea is you model the system with a set of, let's say, differential equations, and then you use this to analyze the behavior of the system and ultimately design a control system to achieve some objective which we'll talk about. Okay, so the second big part of the course um, and control in general is process dynamics. So here we're talking about steady, studying unsteady, you know, this is all interchangeable, right? Dynamics, unsteady state, transient, they all mean, all mean the same thing. And these come about if we're interested in starting up or shutting down the plant. Um, there's some disturbance that affects the plant if we change the production rate. So, I mean, if you went into industry and you asked somebody who's a process engineer, control engineer, how often their plant operates at steady state, they'll tell you it never, never operates at steady state. Never. Okay. These are situations where there'll be big changes from steady state to steady state, but in general, plants are always dynamic and, and responding to the environment in which they're operating. Okay, to me, this is very underemphasized in a lot of the courses, so when I teach 361, it's not uncommon that students have almost not seen dynamics or transient behavior at all, maybe a little bit of kinetics, but it's, so it's not taught a lot. So we'll address it again. And obviously, this is the main focus of the course, which is process control. So here we're talking about um, designing. When I say implementing, um, I'm, I'm really talking about how we do this in, let's say, an industrial environment. So first thing you have to do is design a control system, then you actually have to implement it in the by automatic control, I mean we want a system that operates the plant to a large degree autonomously without intervention. Okay? Um, if you go back 100 years, let's say how plants were operated, they're all operated by operators. So operators are turning valves and operating the plant manually. And then when, with the advent of, let's say, computer technology, even before that, pneumatic technology, then people started automating these plants. So now the operators watch the control 
control system. It's kind of like, you know, a plane is flown, right? Pilot does not fly a plane. Pilot puts input into the control system that flies the plane. Okay. So it's the same kind of thing. Now, operators monitor the control system. They, for a large part, don't operate the plane themselves. These are the kind of things we'd like to control it. For the most part, it's one low-level flow control. You have flow in and out of a reactor. Control temperature control of a polymer reactor. Uh, controlling compositions in and out of unit operations. We like to um, control entire unit operations. I mean, like an entire column, for example, which might involve lots of these different controllers. And then at the end of the course, I'll talk about something called plant-wide control. So that's like the integrated, you know, separations, reaction, and so on that would take place in the plant. Might have a couple reactors and five columns like the plant. Um, so here is the 